Seema Modi is back at headquarters breaking it all down. Hey, Seema. Hey, Melissa, that's right. What's striking is just the speed of the Bitcoin rally. The move from 8,000 to 9,000 took only seven days, the fastest 1,000 the fastest a thousand point jump on record for the cryptocurrency. And at $9,586, Bitcoin's market cap has reached $160 billion, making it bigger than GE, Boeing, and Disney. Coinbase, the largest Bitcoin exchange, added an estimated 300,000 users just in the past week alone as more retail investors opened accounts during the holiday weekend. Coinbase now has more users than brokerage Charles Schwab, which in mid-November reported it had 10.6 million active brokerage accounts in October, compared to Coinbase's 11.7 million users, that according to data compiled by Atlanta Digital Currency Fund. While Bitcoin continues to climb, but more influential investors like Citadel CEO Ken Griffin remain cautious. Here's what he told CNBC's Leslie Picker earlier today on Squawk Alley. Bitcoin right now has many of the elements of the tulip ball mania that we saw back hundreds of years ago in Holland. But these bubbles tend to end in tears, and I worry about how this bubble might end. My next big test for Bitcoin will be the CME Group's launch of the Bitcoin futures contract set for December 10th, Melissa, as we were discussing. All right, Seema, thank you, Seema Modi, uh, with the latest on Bitcoin. And BK, what do you make of this? Recent and are, and are, and are, are you tearing up? Are you, huh? And are you tearing I'm up? I'm not tearing up yet. I mean, tearing listen, up in I, laughter at Ken Griffin? Or <laughs> exactly. what are you talking about? Well, I mean, exactly. first of all, the, the tulip bulb analogy to me is laughable. I mean, listen, tulip bulbs didn't disrupt an industry. This is a technology that's disrupting financial services. I can't point to exactly what tulip bulbs disrupted. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think it's a terrible analogy Daffodil and bulbs. people should stop, stop using it. Uh, in terms of what drove this, a lot of retail buying, really interesting to see the surge of buying after Thanksgiving. So I put a little chart here together. You see that small little box where Bitcoin and all the other three currencies that Coinbase trades going down? That's during Thanksgiving. People literally eating turkey, talking to the family, telling them how great cryptocurrencies is. And then look at the surge. As soon as the banks open on Friday and money can fiat money can come into the system, boom, you get this massive surge of the three coins that are traded at uh, Coinbase, which is where everybody is kind of the funnel that U.S. investors come in. So really interesting. I think a lot of retail people just said, hey, I want in on this trend. Oh. Back in October, Galaxy, Inve Galaxy Investment Partner CEO and hedge fund legend Mike Novogratz called for Bitcoin to rally to $10,000. Here's what he said. It would not surprise me if in the next six to ten months we're over 10000 Well, at the rate Bitcoin's going, we won't need a couple of months. The cryptocurrency has almost doubled Since that call sitting at less than 500 bucks away from that $10,000 mark, we will probably hit 10000 in the next five minutes or so. <laughs> Question now, how much higher could Bitcoin go? What is fueling this rally? We have brought Mike Novogratz back to answer those burning questions for us. Mike, it's always great to see you. Thanks Good for Good to see back. you. Um, what's your next call? <laughs> My next call. Put me on the spot. <laughs> Listen, I mean, to start with, you know, trees don't grow to the sky, and the pace of this move has been really fast. And so on one hand, Lots of the speculative, uh, you know, sensors are out. You know, the amount of retail customers coming in, the amount of phone calls I get, uh, that gets me a little bit nervous that we could have a short-term top. On the other hand, when I step back, I'm like, wait a minute. The whole market cap of all the crypto is $300 billion. That's nothing. Uh, the, the NASDAQ at its high in the 1999 bubble was $6 trillion. And the NASDAQ was a U.S.-led you know, bubble. This is a global phenomenon. 60, 70 percent of all trading volume in these cryptos are happening in Japan and Korea. And so I have a sense that this is going to go a lot further. When I try to think of valuation, Bitcoin really has taken the use case of digital gold. Gold's eight trillion or seven and a half trillion dollars. And so at 150 billion Bitcoin, you know, 30 times, 40 times, 50 times higher than here, uh, then you're starting to look like Bitcoin's replaced gold, uh, or at least it's, it's on parity of gold. And so my short-term call, I guess, is things have gone pretty far, and maybe you'll backfill a little bit, but in, over the medium term, you know, this thing is going to go a lot, lot higher. I, I said recently I thought total market cap by the end of next year would be a trillion. You know, that's probably a little light, but if it's a trillion to two trillion, that's kind of 6x from 
where we are now, and that's it's not all going to go into Bitcoin. Sixty thousand from where we are. Sorry, six, six times. Six, oh, six, six times. times. Okay. Six times two hundred. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, three hundred billion. Six times three hundred billion gets you a two trillion dollar market cap by the end of two thousand eighteen. And you know, there's Ethereum, there's Bitcoin, there's Bitcoin Cash, there's EOS, there's all kinds of protocols. So, what are the assumptions? I mean, you made the, the parallel to the Nasdaq during the bubble days and the total market cap of the Nasdaq back then. What is the assumption on how high, how high Bitcoin could go? Is there an assumption in your well, head? When I look at gold, is, is, it, and is it all of the market cap of gold right now? Uh, that why why, why not in some ways? And so each of these tokens represent individual ecosystems, right? There's one for cloud computing. There's one for file sharing. There's one for online gambling. Bitcoin is, is the, the ecosystem of digital money or digital store of wealth. And it's really more digital store wealth or digital gold. And so if gold's a trillion, I'm not, I don't understand why Bitcoin can't get there. Uh, so, Mike, everybody asks me, what derails this? What keeps you up at night, right? We know the bull case is working, but you wake up one day and this one thing happens. What is it that scares you? Well, I'd hate for myself to get hacked because that would really suck. <laughs> um, but a, a really major exchange being hacked in a major way. We've had plenty of small hacks, people, and, and small in comparison to market cap. But a major hack or a real change of, of, of mindset on the regulators. Uh, right now, most regulators have been working with the system. Uh, we work a lot ourselves with the regulators. Uh, if for some reason they woke up and did an about face, that would, would be no good. So, Mike, you mentioned that you're kind of getting a little nervous about this speculative fervor. You know, I've heard you on a few occasions talk about you started buying Ethereum in the low, in single digits, right? Yes. And so now it's it's just below 500. So yeah. how do you get, you know, all these people are opening up these hundreds of thousands of Coinbase accounts just in the last couple of weeks. How do you go out and talk to these people about what the opportunity is? For you, you knew that you could lose a few dollars when you paid a few dollars for Ethereum. Now it's almost $500. And it's really hard to talk about the long-term vision to $2 trillion and all of these. You know what I mean? So how do you... How do you so what, what I about? tell people, you know, the retail type customer, I said... Put one to three percent of your net worth in it, because if it goes down fifty percent, it's like buying one to three percent of Google, and it goes down fifty percent. Uh, for wealthier people who can afford a little bigger loss, yeah, take it to five percent or even ten percent. Uh, but I don't recommend anybody throw their entire net worth into. This. What is your net worth uh, in terms of how much is tied up? In, in uh, you know, I'm probably over twenty percent at this point, and. Uh, um, you know, because it keeps going up and I take some off and then I get, well, why am I taking it off and I buy more? Maybe it's even 30%. Um, what do you think about futures? The CME is going to launch its futures for Bitcoin. Um, December 10th is the date right now. What does that do to Bitcoin, if anything? Does it suppress volatility? Does it cause more volatility? I think in the short run, uh, the future will not be as exciting as if people are hoping it will because it's going to take a while for it to, to build liquidity. Uh, the really promising part of the future, though, is when you have a future, you'll need a stock borrow. You'll, you know, and all of a sudden, you'll have a lending market in Bitcoin. And as soon as you have a lending market in Bitcoin, guess what? Then you have an interest rate curve in Bitcoin. And all of a sudden, Bitcoin starts looking more like a currency than it ever did. Uh, you know, it's very difficult right now. That's not there's not an efficient market to buy it, to borrow or uh, uh, or lend against uh, all of these coins. And I think the future market will really accelerate that. Is there a trading opportunity surrounding the launch and the early days of Bitcoin futures? I, I think this march of institutionalization of the whole crypto space is just a positive. And so the fact that the CME is credentializing this uh, is a huge win. And I think that's part of what's driven the price up here. Uh, I think once it gets going and starts building liquidity, just more access to the market. Mike, you mentioned that, that Bitcoin with the yield curve could look more like a currency. So what, if anything, does the future of Bitcoin mean to currencies, the U.S. dollar, I mean, global currencies? In the short run, nothing. Uh, why? Because currencies need real stability, right? I, I've said this before, the, the dollar versus the yen, which I focused on very closely for 25 years of my life, quite frankly, never moves more than plus or minus 6% in a year, maybe 10%. Uh, my wife once said, are you going to spend your whole career looking at that little squiggly line? Uh, Bitcoin is moving too fast with too much volatility to ever really be a currency, right? This water can't cost a dollar one day and $6 a month later. Uh, and so until there's real stability in price, it won't be used as a Bears currency. Bears will say that that's the exact reason why Bitcoin isn't yeah. any kind of currency. That it's well, but gold, you know, it's when's the last time you bought a pair of shoes in gold? Right? Never. Uh, or even a pair of shoes and a quarter of a Google share. 
Never. Uh, the, 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 the argument is also that you can't speculate in currencies when, in fact, I think people are speculating in currencies all the time. The, the ranges are then levered up, but they're smaller ranges, but they are. But, you know, you talk about the, the, the risks here and you talk about you getting hacked. Um, how do you protect a digital wallet in, in this day and age? And what are people doing to, to, because to, the amount of wealth that they have stored here is almost, this is the part that's difficult for me. Not difficult for me to see why it's going higher and why people want to own it. How do you protect yourself? So, you know, when it was a small amount of money, you didn't worry about it so much. It becomes a big amount of money, you start worrying about it a lot. Um, the exchanges, the custody places, and, and places like us who both self-custody and use custody places, you take your keys off the, the Internet. And so it's called cold storage. You actually put your private keys on a computer in a safe, and you put that safe in a really safe place. Uh, that's safe. The, the percentage of your coins that you want to leave active to be able to trade back and forth, uh, those have more risk on it. Now, let's say you put some on Coinbase and some on Gemini and some on the various exchanges. Each of those places is doing the same thing. They're keeping 90% of their coins offline. And so if I put 10% of my coins online in 10 different places, 1% in each, and they're doing that, all of a sudden I have very, very little you know, at risk to a hack. And so that's why this is a lot safer than it feels, uh, as long as you're using prudent uh, risk management. All right, I'm going to go back to the first question that I asked you in this interview, and that is your forecast for Bitcoin. Give me a level for 2018. Where do you see Bitcoin going? You're very decisive in your interview no, last month, and you're very spot <laughs> <you're laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I, Bitcoin could be at 40000 at the end of the 2018. It really easily could. Um, and I think Ethereum, you know, which I think will just touch 500 or is getting close, could, could be triple where it is as well. Um, there's a big wave of money coming, not just here, uh, but all around the world. And you know, as we push more people into the system, both retail and institutional, um, what's different about these coins than other commodities. So like when the price of oil went up to $150, uh, what happened? You know, we started drilling in the Canadian tar sands. We started going deep sea in Brazil. Uh, we started investing in solar and fracking and everything else. And there's a supply response. There is no supply response here. So it's a speculator's dream in that as buying happens, there's, there's no new supply that comes out. And so every price moves gets exaggerated. It's going to get exaggerated on the way up, and there will be 50% corrections. It will get exaggerated on the way down. So people read, people read about the mining farms all over the world in China. They have huge warehouses, and they're just filled with Bitcoin miners. So that doesn't count as supply coming on in response to prices that are going higher. No. So that's just what it means is as prices go higher, it gets more difficult uh, to mine uh, those coins because it's more valuable. More people are chasing each coin. But there's a total amount of Bitcoins that will ever be mined. Uh, it was 21 million, apparently up to 3 million or 4 million have been lost forever. And so total supply of Bitcoin is really set. Uh, and so the miners really are used to authenticate right. and validate the blockchain. So here's a question. This is from my mother who just opened her own Coinbase ah. account uh, and this a couple months a ago. So mom, if you're listening, <laughs> would you rather Bitcoin or Ethereum here? Or Litecoin? Let's throw that in. Of the three. You know, I have roughly half of Bitcoin and half of Ethereum. Um, I don't like Litecoin nearly as much. Uh, it seems like the poor man's Bitcoin to me. Um, Bitcoin and Ethereum have very different use cases. Uh, Bitcoin really is this ecosystem of, of digital store wealth. And Ethereum is one of the, uh, the contenders to be the ecosystem of really kind of the decentralized computer that most of these projects get built off of. Um, but I'm also spreading my bets because, you know, I learned in the Chinese internet where I picked one company which went to zero and every other company would have made me a fortune, <laughs> uh, that nobody's smart enough to really understand how this future of a uh, industry that's changing as rapidly as this one is. And so I've got lots of bets as hedges in other ecosystems, uh, you know, and so that makes it, a, makes it kind of like a half venture business and half long right. short equity business. Okay. Mike, good to see you again. Hope you come back soon. Mike Thanks so much. Congrats, Galaxy Investments. BK. Uh, well, it's interesting that Mike talked about, about the, the mining and the supply response, right? We had this report that possibly yeah. three to four million of the Bitcoin are lost or locked up or something like that. So if you think about it, there's 21 million Bitcoin that'll ever be out there. There's 16 million in existence. 
Let's say there's 4 million that are lost that can never be moved. Now you're at 20 million. That means there's only a million Bitcoin left for people to buy, in a sense. So it's a massive, I think that was also part of the big move that we had. That's a 25% of the supply that has been taken out. So that, I think, was really interesting. One thing is very different, like Mike said, about this versus commodities. I'm going to bring something up. Steve Grosso's mentioned this. It's important to mention. Overstock was a $30 stock when Steve started talking about it on the back of what they were doing in Bitcoin. The stock traded 65.70 today. I bring it up because it reversed to close down 9.5%. Uh, you know, again, I'm not certain that Overstock well, look what is Square selling. did today. On, the, on, on the, a downgrade. On, the, on yeah. the downgrade based upon this exact point. Very interesting, though. So what does it mean for the price? I don't know, but I think it's worth watching because the two are trading in tandem. Yeah, I would just make one other point. What he just mentioned about, uh, Mike mentioned about Bitcoin versus Ethereum. When you think about Ethereum, it really is more of a VC-centric sort of uh, thing. You know, th this is what companies and entire platforms are being built on. That so to me, it, two very different things. The store of value with Bitcoin, you think it's going to forty thousand uh, dollars, but there's going to be a lot of opportunities built on the ETH, uh, Ethereum network too. And a quick price is right on Mike's forecast: Bitcoin to forty thousand next year. Is the price oh. right, higher or lower? Uh, I, you know what? I'll go out on a limb. I'll go higher. I don't know if it goes higher up. from exactly here. We might get a dip first, but I'll say higher. All right. Still ahead, Amazon soaring to new highs after crushing Black Friday. But if history is any indication, the top could be in for the year. We will explain. Plus, it is a rally that Wall Street just can't get behind. A majority of strategists missing the mark this year. And it looks like there could be a bunch of timid bulls next year, too. But we'll tell you why that might be a good thing for the markets. Much